What'd you make, Michelle? Smartest thing. Yeah, very nice. Now I feel like we've done something wrong here. We're the only ones that stayed in. We're going out next year. <laughs> Yeah. We're gonna end up. We, we used to do our big meal on Saturday because it was just too much. Yeah. See, we got Easter Sunday, Easter Monday. We're gonna end, we're gonna end up having Easter Tuesday and then Easter leftovers and then all sorts of whatever whatever else we want to call it. Who had spam? That's the question. Who went back to their bachelor days? Juan might have had spam, actually. He loves spam. That's not even a joke. He, he loves, he loves spam. He might have had an MRE. I don't know. He's not listening to me. So he's just going to ignore me. What? <laughs> That's all right, though. Nothing but, oh, you're going to do, we're going to do church things now? Okay. All right. Sure, why not?
page 243 in your hymnal. 243. Let's see if we can get this thing off the ground. Page 243. Find your place, let's stand as we sing. I've heard an old, old story How a Savior came from glory How he gave his life on Calvary To save a wretch like me I heard about his groaning Of his precious blood's atoning Then I repented of my sins and won the victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and he bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me and I knew him and all my love is to him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. I heard about his healing, of his cleansing fire revealing. How he made the lame to walk again, and he calls the blind to see. And then I cried, Jesus, come and heal my bro. And somehow Jesus came and brought to me the victory. Oh, victory, my Savior, hello. He sought me and he bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me and knew him. And all my love is to him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. I heard about John, he spilled for me in glory. And I heard about the streets of gold beyond the crystal sea. About the angel singing and the old redemption story and some sweet day I'll sing up there the song of victory victory in Jesus my Savior he sought me and he bought me with his redeeming blood he loved me him and all my love is to him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. Amen. Boy, we're singing all the great ones today, aren't we? Boy, what a joy to know we have victory in Jesus. So, 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 so wonderful. What a great day. I hope that you have had a blessed day as well, worshiping here as well as with your families. And so let's look to the Lord as we continue our worship this day. Father, let's, or let's pray. Father, we thank you and we love you and we're so thankful for all that you've given to us in Jesus Christ, for the victory that has been assured. And Father, I pray that you'll help us to remember that victory during the times of challenge and struggle and moments of weariness. God, I pray that we will be revived within our inner self, that you renew daily by your spirit. And I pray that we will see just how important, pivotal it is to believe in the resurrection moment by moment. Not that we need to be saved or born again, but that we have truly appropriated that truth to make a real, tangible, effective difference in our life. So God, as we do these things, we yield our lives to you. We open up our hearts to you by your grace and ask you to direct us by your spirit according to your word. That way we can glorify you on this earth. And we thank you that we know you in Jesus' name. Amen. Remain standing. Brother Barry will come as you turn to page 288, 288. I am 
resolved. I am resolved no longer to linger, charmed by the world's delight. Things that are higher, things that are nobler, these have alert my sight. I will hasten to him, hasten so glad and free. Jesus, greatest, highest, I will come to thee. I am resolved to go to the Savior, leaving my sin and strife. He is the true one, he is the just one, he hath the words of life. I will hasten to him, hasten so glad and free. Jesus, greatest, highest, I will come to thee. I am resolved to follow the Savior, faithful and true each day. He what he saith, do what he willeth, he is the living away. I will hasten to him, hasten to glad and free. Jesus, greatest, highest, I will come to thee. A few pages back, 261. 261. Oh, so are you weary and troubled. No light in the darkness you see. There's light for a look at the Savior, and life more abundant and free. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. The things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Through death into life everlasting, he passed and we follow him there. Over us sin no more hath dominion. For more than conquerors we are. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. His word shall not fail you, he promised. Believe him and all will be well. Then go to a world that is dying his perfect salvation to tell. Turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Amen. Thank you. you. May be seated. We're going to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter number 15. A great chapter on the resurrection, the reality of the resurrection, which in fact is my sermon title tonight. And we have some folks making their way down and I want to give people an opportunity uh, to do two things. Pray for the parents in the room, because uh, their children will be here with them. <laughs> I notice a lot of people on this side don't have any children, and uh, if it gets too much, just send them over there, all right? They're, they're, they will be there with arms wide open. And then secondly, if anyone has a testimony that they would like to share, <laughs> excuse me, we'll uh, certainly make a, an opportunity available for folks to 
share a little testimony? Yes. Mark and I would like to thank everybody here at this church. We have felt so comfortable, so comfortable, so loving. And we had no idea what that means, especially being here for three months. We were sad in the morning. But thank you for the message, thank you for the life group, that to get to know people. Yeah. And it's all because of Jesus. Absolutely. That's amazing. Well, praise the Lord. I think I think the Young at Heart Life Group has the most life in it, actually. You know, every time well, I just I get text, we just had an amazing time and it was just so awesome. And I was like, man, alive, boy, I guess so what happens when you get the kids out of the house, you know? So you you've given some of us a lot to look forward to, and we appreciate that. But it's uh, it's always a blessing to have y'all and uh, so thankful. We're already looking forward to the next time that y'all will be able to come back down. And so uh, if we don't see you on the way up, we'll see you. We'll see you here. And so it'll be great. Anybody else? Anybody else with a word of testimony that they'd like to share? Oh, yes, Ms. Sheila. Oh, wow. Well, amen. No kidding. Well, that's a great day. It's a great day. Anyway, great day to get saved. 50. Wow. I wasn't going to ask because I'm a gentleman, <laughs> but thank you for sharing that. 51 years. Damon, you want to share something, bud? Um, my mom, my son, she has four kids. Um, she has three dollars, but he's only more, so she can get a house. And I'm hoping that someday we'll finally get the house. Okay. Yeah. 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 Excellent, excellent pronunciation. Yes, you know what? We'll pray about that, okay? We'll pray for you and your family and uh, let the Lord do his work. I think I think I saw Amber over here. Yes. Yeah, we talked about that a little bit. Wow, that's great. <laughs> I don't know, you know, you know, good old, good old military, you know, they just changed their mind. But, you know, Matt's always ready. So um, that's awesome. Earlier, Amber and I talked about, I said, oh, what's Matt doing for Easter? And he said, well, or she said, oh, probably nothing. They're out in the field and they're doing, I'm like, but it's Easter. So they were going to have Easter Tuesday. And uh, so it's a blessing that Matt was able to have uh, a couple of services out there. And I know he's had quite a few people, uh, quite a few Marines attend those services too. So that's pretty exciting. Anybody else? Going once, going twice. All right. Oh, almost was. Yes, sir. Amen. Well, it's just. Just, it seems like Easter, the day Easter, each, each year, uh, nature, animals, birds, everything is just chiming in to remind us coming back. Mm -hmm. And uh, just, just as all the prophet, prophetic events that took place at Calvary uh, were real and true, is coming back as well. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, <clears throat> Absolutely. I want to do a shout out to Debbie Mark as well. They have done a special lesson to, to, to us and uh, the church family and uh, HC and Go. Mm -hmm. That's a good choice for the Lord to see them. See them. Absolutely. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Anyone else? Sam would have never guessed. <laughs> uh, just this morning on the Maiden Service, uh, they just came to us on the CPI and we were to see the different ones. Uh, I see Matt's face is amazing. He's red, out of breath, but the magic lesson that that added to the service, service this morning, I mean, it was just, that was an amazing addition. Absolutely. Absolutely. 
It, it really did. That that song was amazing. And um, I wonder, I saw Matt grab uh, a hymn book and then take it down there. I was like, oh, maybe it's for the kids. And then I see him chugging away on that thing. And I went, yes, all right. Man, that's great. Good thing we didn't have a microphone over there. Good night. So... <laughs> Um, but man, what what an amazing, amazing time. I was I was overwhelmed and so encouraged and just I, I enjoyed even seeing how all of us were being moved by the music and the service and uh, very, very touching. So wonderful service this morning. All right. Anything else? Anybody else? Oh, there. I see that hand. Yes. Sorry, I had to be a Baptist preacher for once today. And it seemed like a big thing. It is so for those of you that don't know how I like shooting. No. Uh, and Lord Jamie Boss was actually letting me let me go shoot in the Marine Corps competition, which is a really big deal because nobody migrated ever gets to Oh, that's sad but true. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was incredible to me that my boss didn't want to go to the first one because it took me out of the office for two weeks. And then I played, which blew my mind. So I asked if I could go to the championship. I could play for the next thing you know. Um, but it said yes again, so I was wrong again for a week and a half. Um, and then they asked me to go on the shooting team for the summer. Once again, I expect my boss to say no, and he said yes. So, and for a lot of people, it's not again like shooting too much on one of them, and should be, but it's just neat to me to see how God provides for us and lets us do things that we enjoy. Mm-hmm. Uh, just because we enjoy them. Um, and then we have a God that enjoys the biggest good news with the loving prize. Loves to see us uh, enjoy life. Absolutely. <laughs> You placed third out of how many? Twelve. Twelve? You yeah. took bronze in one competition. Okay. And these are the top 98 in the Marine Corps, what he won't tell you, because he's far too humble. And so to place 12th out of all the thousands of people that could have been selected, those that were selected, and then those that made the cut to get to the special competition and then to be able to place. And he also, he had a bronze medal of some kind, right? Uh, Bronze Bronze medal for rifle. All right. So no no more. No one else may understand this. No more pizza boxes. All right. So stick your ice cream, but no pizza boxes. Okay. From Sunday school. All right. Anybody else? Anybody else? If I cut it down the last minute, pretend like I'm going to start preaching, someone will put a hand up. And so that's okay. All right. Turn in your. Okay. I think we're serious. All right. First Corinthians chapter 15. Some of you are there. I want to make sure we're all there. We're going to read verses 1 through 11. I'm going to kind of give you a, a brief overview of portions of this. And so. You shouldn't be alarmed by now, especially after you've seen what I've done to Isaiah. And uh, you can interpret that however you want. But uh, I want to continue in the spirit of Easter to look at what the Bible says uh, about the reality of the resurrection. And most emphatically, if you're thinking about the resurrection explained outside of the four Gospels, uh, your, your Bible should naturally open to 1 Corinthians 15. When you think resurrection, think 1 Corinthians chapter 15, because the whole chapter explains the importance and the practicalities and the credibility and the applications of the resurrection. That is what it's about. So we're going to read the first 11 verses, and then we'll uh, follow on from there. So I will read, beginning in verse 1. 
Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel, which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures." and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures, and that he was seen of Cephas, that's Peter, then of the twelve. After that he was seen of above five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some have fallen asleep. After that he was seen of James, then of all the apostles." And last of all, he was seen of me also, as, one, as of one born out of due time. For I am the least of the apostles that, I am, that am not meet to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace, which was bestowed upon me, was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I but the grace of God which was with me. Therefore, whether it, whether it were I or they, so we preach, and so ye believed. My message tonight, again, is entitled, The Reality of the Resurrection. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. <clears throat> Lord, we thank you for your grace, your truth, this grace and truth that has made us what we are. And God, I pray that as we look to you, thanking you for the gospel which we have heard and received, and that for that grace that has changed us to be more like your Son. I pray, Father, that you'll give us an understanding of the importance of the resurrection as it relates so practically to our lives. Be glorified in our offer of worship in this sermon, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. What would happen to the Christian faith if the resurrection were false? I imagine that the news media would be in all their glory reporting the baselessness and irrationality of this <clears throat> religion. I like to use my imagination and most of the time that doesn't get me into any trouble. And I started to think, you know what, if Jerusalem had its own news media, if we could put someone in a DeLorean and send them back into time to the first century, and that person was a newscaster, and they were on the scene reporting about what might have happened if the Jewish skeptics and alleged scholars had their way. I wonder if the news report would have sounded something like this. Good evening. This is Judas, I cannot believe it, reporting live from Calvary, the so-called tomb of Jesus just outside of Jerusalem. On the eve of the annual celebration of the resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth, the one million inhabitants of this city were shocked by the announcement that a body has been discovered, the body of Jesus. Rumor have been circulating the last week that a very important discovery was about to be announced. This news, however, far outstrips our wildest guesses. The initial reactions of Christians here and around the world had been one of astonishment, bewilderment, and defense, or defensive disbelief. Jewish skeptics and scholars are gathering to celebrate the announcement. It appears that Christianity will have to take its place on the same level with the other religions of the world. Bob, back to you in the studio. All right, maybe that last part was a little bit more, a little bit much. Now, if, if, if this imagined newscast was true, then your faith in Christ would be absolutely worthless. And you and I would still be under the curse of our sins. Now, the doctrine of the resurrection has profound implications for anyone and everyone when it comes to their lives. And here's why. The resurrection of Christ in the past and the resurrection of human beings in the future, which will be for all people, we'll see as we get over to a cross-reference in John, 
the resurrection of human beings in the future will have deep practical significance for the present, the right here and now, because it changes the way that we experience life right now on a daily basis. Now, Paul is going to take up this argument for the gospel throughout this whole chapter and emphasize the resurrection. He is careful to address the credibility, the realities, and the practicalities of Jesus' resurrection. Now, the first thing that we'll start with, as I read in the first 11 verses, is the credibility of the resurrection. And when I come to this text, and this, especially these 11 verses, I ask this question, which Paul will answer. How do we know that we can believe the resurrection? Now, to put us in a historical context, modern individuals, just like ancient individuals, have a very difficult time accepting the idea that someone could legitimately rise from the dead. To claim that a human being actually expired, was buried, and then three days later rose again from the ground without any human intervention, without any technology, without any means of resuscitation, is frankly just too fantastic and nearly unbelievable all on its own. And typically, people will assume the gullibility of ancient people. They think, well, they just they would believe anything. And believing in that gullibility allows them to believe that this is all just something silly, incredulous, of, of absolutely no good report. However, using a little common sense, ancient people had just as much difficulty with the resurrection as anyone else would. Death is death. People die. They're dead. It's not as though the ancients had some permeable understanding of death that someone would sort of kind of die and then whoo, just swoon back to life. <laughs> they had no expectation that any individual that actually died would come back from the grave. A resurrection was just as preposterous to the ancient mind, to the ancient individual, as it is to the modern skeptics and scholars. People aren't supposed to rise from the dead, in case you hadn't noticed. And that's true, regardless of anyone's cultural or historical context or background. Now, I like to think about 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and I hope this is an appropriate way to think about this. I imagine this chapter as a courtroom scene. And as we unfold the text more and more, this will begin to make more sense. But let me frame your thinking. Your faith in the bodily resurrection is on trial. It's a trial by jury that's going to be held. And the jury consists of the minds and hearts of those persons who are unsure about the matter. They haven't made up their mind. Now, God is the judge, and the accusers are those who deny the resurrection. And the prosecuting attorneys are certain Greek philosophers who say that in eternity, our souls have no bodies. And the attorney for the defense in this case is Paul. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 11, or verses 1 through 11, Paul lays out his case. He cited the fulfillment of scriptures from the Old Testament, not just the New. He's not simply referring to the four Gospels. He's referring to the Old Testament scriptures, speaking to the prophetic fulfillment of the Messiah as it is found in Jesus Christ. And he calls to witness, uh, he calls witnesses to testify about these events. Paul provides his own testimony, which we read about in verse 1 and again in verse 4. And he goes on to name specific witnesses by name, Cephas, James, other apostles, in fact, all the apostles. And then he will, he, in, a, in a manner of speaking, he subpoenaed every one of those 500 people that he could find that he knows are still actually alive. He says, we're going to have these 500, or at least the ones that are still alive, ready to testify. They're waiting in the wings. They just need to be called and sworn in. Now, what's surprising about this text is the amount of evidence for the resurrection is actually substantial. It's incredible. If you called all of these witnesses to the stand and asked them to testify firsthand what they saw 
rather who they saw with their own eyes, the testimony would drag on and on and on for weeks and weeks and weeks. And an uncertain jury would sit there and say, how can I deny that these literally hundreds of people testifying to the firsthand knowledge, they knew Jesus before, they could identify him afterwards, they know with certainty that he is alive. There was no mass hallucination, there was no psychotropic drugs involved, there, there was no hoax, no scandal, no scheme. These people truly saw Jesus of Nazareth, who was legitimately dead and authentically alive. Just as he said, even today, renowned atheists have acknowledged there is substantial, legitimate, accurate evidence that points to the resurrection, not merely an empty tomb. Because even that theory, oh, well, they just went to the wrong tomb, even though even in our text today in Mark uh, chapter 15, they knew exactly what tomb it was. And if they didn't know, if the women didn't know, uh, the owner of the tomb, Joseph of Arimathea, certainly knew where the tomb was that he'd purchased originally. But here, even these renowned atheists, as I'll list here in just a moment, understand and recognize not just the legitimacy of an empty tomb, but the actual testimonies of a risen Savior. They've investigated the claims for themselves. For example, a man by the name of J. Warner Wallace is a homicide detective who applied his investigative techniques to examining the claims of Jesus Christ. And he uses those same forensic techniques to come to the conclusion that Jesus Christ is alive, that he indeed rose from the dead. And if you would like to merely Google an interesting uh, clip of him, he appeared as himself in the film God's Not Dead 2, part 2. And you can see some of his own testimony, and you can also read some of his own books. Another man with whom you may be familiar is a, a man by the name of Lee Strobel. Anyone heard of him? Okay, just a couple. Lee Strobel's journey to Jesus is recorded in the book and captured in the movie by the title of The Case for Christ. And he was an investigative journalist who was an unbeliever. And he used his research abilities to investigate Jesus' assertions and claims, and especially his resurrection. And if you want to read the book, I would highly encourage that. If you want to save a little bit of time, you can also watch the movie. And you will see a man's journey from, from unbelief and all that comes with that to a man who earnestly desired to know the truth and as a result, earnestly came to know the truth that is in Jesus Christ. Now, one of the most respected atheistic philosophers of, uh, of probably the last 50 or 60 years is a man by the name of Anthony Flew, F-L-E-W. And he claims this, and I'll quote him, the evidence for the resurrection is better than for claimed miracles in any other religion. It's outstandingly different in quality and quantity from the evidence offered for the occurrence of most other supposedly miraculous events. Now, the interesting thing about Anthony Flew is that he did not become a Christian. He moved from an atheist to a theist, but never embraced Christianity, and yet still asserts that the proof of the resurrection, the evidence for the resurrection is there, and it's valid and authentic, and it's worth believing. But not everyone takes that leap of faith, do they? Now, for Paul, he will finally address the jury as he's applied the evidence and the testimony of his life, his human experience, and the firsthand witnesses of others. And then his closing argument, if you'll allow me to continue the illustration, will be on the basis of strong logic and a search for favorable verdict that actually goes from verses 12 through the rest of this chapter to verse 58. So to summarize Paul's argument, as we read in the first 11 verses, we can affirm that the resurrection gives ultimate and supreme credibility to all that we do in faith and practice. How can I make such an affirmation? As we'll continue here in the next few verses, because there's not just credibility in the resurrection. There's realities that make this so important to our life that without these realities, everything we do 
And I don't mean to speak with hyperbole, generalizations, or exaggerations. Everything that we do in the name of God or of Christ is absolutely empty and worthless. It's just a check in the box with no point in checking the box. Let's continue. We'll read verses 12 through 19, and we'll pick up a little bit more as we go along. Now, if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, I'll say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead. But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen? And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain? And your faith is also vain. It's empty. It's meaningless. Yea, and we are found false witnesses of God, because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he raised not up, if so be that the dead rise not. For if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain. Ye are yet in your sins. Then they also, which are fallen asleep in Christ, that is, those who put their faith fraudulently in Christ, that means they put their faith in Christ in vain, they're perished. They're gone. Hopeless. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. Now I'm going to ask you this tongue-in-cheek, okay? Okay. Is there somewhere else you'd rather be tonight? No preacher, no preacher. Okay, good, good answer, good answer, yes. Family few, good answer, good answer. Show me no preacher. Number one answer, all right, it's fantastic. But if this is just smoke and mirrors, you might as well be somewhere else tonight. That's what he's saying. If all you have is this life without Christ and the people that died professing Christ, they're just people in a box in a field somewhere. Go, go buy a boat and go fishing. <laughs> Church, what's that? Six o'clock? You can meet at midnight for all I care. I'm not going. Preaching? Oh, my goodness. I got to endure enough. You know what I'm saying? You're saying I don't have to do this anymore? Woo! Man, as the piano plays... What's the point of it if there's no foundation of the resurrection? Paul says there is no point. Tim Keller would comment on this, and he described the resurrection as the hinge upon which the story of the world pivots. Why? Because everything matters. If the resurrection is nothing, it's an old wives' tale, it's a hoax, it's a scam, then we're just here checking a box for grins and giggles to make ourselves feel better about who knows what. Tim Keller and others like him make this grandiose statement because if the resurrection's not real, then everything about our faith absolutely falls apart. But why bring all this up, Paul, with a group of believers like the saints in Corinth? I know they weren't perfect, but why bring it up at all? And here's why. The Corinthians had not taken into account the importance of the resurrection in the most practical of ways. They didn't realize all the things that would fall apart without the validity of the resurrection. And let's review it once again. Without the resurrection, Paul's work as an apostle, which he says in verse 13, is then vain. And then, according to verse 14, Christianity itself is in vain. There's no point in having a Christian religion. There's no reason to follow Christ. And he will go on in verse 15 to say, Paul is a liar for misrepresenting God. We said, in the name of God, that Jesus did this. But he didn't because the dead can't rise. Oh, my bad. We're false witnesses. We've claimed to represent God, but we have actually not represented him at all. And then to become even more practical, in verse 17, he says, if Christianity is wrong and I'm here falsely representing God and, and all of this ministry is just smoke and mirrors, then your own personal faith, it's futile. It's an exercise in futility. It, accompl it accomplishes absolutely nothing. And thus, your sin problem and my sin problem is still a very real problem. <laughs> With no solution. We read again for emphasis. 
But if there be no resurrection, verse 13, of the dead, then is Christ not risen. And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain. And your faith is also vain. Yes, and we are found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he raised not up. If so be that the dead rise not. For if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain, ye are yet in your sins. This goes on even further in verse 18. Let's read that. Then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ Jesus are perished. The promises of a new heaven, gone. New earth, empty. There's no afterlife for those who have died. For those who also have fallen asleep in Christ are perished. Perished. There's no hope. Verse 19 continues to affirm that this present life experience of Christians is pointless. And it's to be pitied if there's no resurrection. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. To summarize, Paul is affirming that if the resurrection is false, belief is unreasonable. If Jesus has not been raised from the dead, then the gospel is thoroughly invalidated. The resurrection is the truth on which everything else hinges. We don't want to live a life to be pitied. We don't want to be of all men most miserable, clinging to a false hope. Without the resurrection, Christian ministry is pointless. Personal faith is ineffective. God's character is called into question. Christians are still in need of salvation. Any sense of future hope is utterly removed. And our present experience, why we do what we do, why we say what we say, why we believe what we believe, is absolutely meaningless. But, on the other hand... If Christ did indeed rise from the dead, then the opposite is completely true. That means ministry is meaningful. That means faith is effective. That means God's character is pure. That means Christians are saved indeed. If the Son shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. That's right. Hope is alive, and our present lives, even with their sufferings and challenges, still have value. The reality of the resurrection means that everything changes for those who do not embrace the faith. Because the resurrection is true. And that means that unbelief is preposterous, uh, preposterous and unreasonable. Not belief. Belief is absolutely necessary. I stumbled upon this quote, and I'd like to share it. We'll let it marinate for a little while. Resurrection means endless hope. But no resurrection means a hopeless end. Resurrection means endless hope. But no resurrection means a hopeless end. We are people of an endless hope. Because the resurrection is affirmed. It is concrete, foundational. It is something worthy of our faith and assent. But it is absolutely, historically real. It actually happened. Jesus is alive. And we can absolutely prove it. Now, having established the credibility, as well as the importance of the resurrection itself, we want to examine what practical effect this has on our lives. Or I like to ask the question, what effect should the reality of the resurrection have on my life? And we'll pick up with verse number 24, and we'll read down uh, through verse 28, and we'll pick up a little bit more from there. Then cometh the end, when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God. Even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power, for he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. 
for he hath put all things under his feet. But when he saith, uh, when he saith all things are put under him, it is manifest that he is accepted, which did not put all things under his feet. And, well, we'll stop. No, we'll, let's read verse 28. And when all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the Son also himself be subject unto him that put all things under him, that God may be all in all. Now, as much of a tongue twister as that is, and admittedly, it's a little difficult to follow. Thank you, Paul. <laughs> let, me, let me summarize it this way. When Paul talks about the coming of the kingdom, the subjugation of all things, and in case we missed it, I'm pretty sure that shows up in every verse, that all things will be subjugated unto him. We affirm that we have a profound hope like none other. We have a certified hope that Christ will deliver us into the kingdom of God, and that his reign shall never, ever cease. All things, including death and suffering, are destroyed and subdued under him. And God is all in all. He is supreme. That means, in the most practical of terms, that no matter what we face here and now, he or she, you or I, will know that nothing will ultimately determine our destiny. Jesus has already determined that. No one can take the kingdom away from you, because the king himself has made you an heir. No one is writing you out of the will. No one. The challenges of this life from the cradle to the grave do not in any way, shape, or form change our future with God. Now, do you have this profound sense of destiny with God? I know destiny has a, a, a strange connotation for Christians. But our manifest destiny is that we will be children in the kingdom honoring our king in very real and practical ways, in person, with all physicality, yielding the fullness of our glorified bodies, and even, ooh, help us, our glorified personalities. Help us. Me included. I bet you can't wait to see the new version. Hope it comes with a full set of hair, that's all I'm saying. Miles on these tires. You know, it's, it's not, uh, what do they say? It's not, uh, it's not the years, it's the miles. Can't wait. But do we have this abiding sense that no matter what happens, no matter what pitfalls, no matter what challenges, no matter what ambiguities, no matter what challenges that we face, that nothing, nothing, nothing can separate us from the love of God? I don't know if Tom were here, he'd say amen to that. We are more than conquerors through him that loved us. How's your sense of peace? Is it settled? That in the midst of adversity, you can say, you know, God's still good because I still am headed to the kingdom. I haven't been cut out of the will. He hasn't kicked me outside the gates early ones, or the gate of Jesus Christ, the door which opens to the kingdom. Nothing. Nothing. And here's the challenge that the Corinthians faced. And perhaps we face this as well. They were suffering from one key problem that we'll read about in verses 30 through 34. And it's the root issue. This is where it all comes together. This is what the issue really is. So let's read together. And why stand we in jeopardy every hour? I protest by your rejoicing, which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord. I die daily. If after the manner of men I have fought with beasts at Ephesus, what advantageth it me if the dead rise not? Let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. Be not deceived. Evil communications corrupt good manners. Awake to righteousness and sin not, for some have not the knowledge of God. Speak this to your shame. Now, here's the root issue. 
captured here in these verses. There is a disconnect between intellectual knowledge and transformative knowledge of the resurrection. We can tell you facts. We can relate trivia. We, we can do all of those things. But to be transformed is something totally different. It's radical. It's grace-filled. It's not just head knowledge. It's not just uh, marking a day on the calendar to come celebrate the resurrection. It experiences the transformative power of the resurrection, that dynamic, explosive power to do this directive found in verse number 34, to wake up, to awake to righteousness and sin not. For some have not the knowledge of God, which Paul says, I speak this to your shame. There's too many sleepy Christians that haven't awoken to righteousness and cast off a lifestyle of habitual sin. Practically speaking, these Corinthians were ignoring the significance of the resurrection in order to justify their sinful behaviors. Because if the dead rise not, then let's just eat and drink for tomorrow. We die. We may not even be here tomorrow. If all I'm living for is this life, then let's start living for this life. Get busy living or get busy dying. And the Corinthians made a go of it. They decided if this is all I got, what else is there? Why not live for the here and now? The word awake that we find captured here in verse number uh, 34 is actually a first century idiom. What that means is it's just a phrase that has meaning beyond the meaning of the actual words. Okay, like for a modern example would be this. It's raining cats and dogs. Well, I hope not. You know, I got enough. I got enough animal problems. We cannot afford to build an ark right now. And just, man, if it is literally raining cats and dogs and you're going, are you serious? No, I'm not serious. It's just an example. We have an understanding that if it were indeed raining and somebody says it's raining cats and dogs, we would not expect to go out there and see puppies and kitties and all that. Now, my children would love that. In fact, Anastasia has already got the look on her face like, please, please let it rain cats and dogs. Is that, is that a thing? Can that happen? Can we just stop and have a prayer meeting right now? I'm sorry, honey. I'll, I've broken your heart once again. I'm going to break your kid's heart. Just tell them they can't have a puppy. We understand that it's not actually raining cats and dogs. And so when Paul writes, awake unto righteousness, in this context of facing challenges and being fought, uh, or fighting with beasts and, and being overwhelmed and facing uh, all the challenging confrontations that Paul would, would list later on in his ministry, how he was betrayed and overwhelmed, how he was in famine and how he was in fastings often and how he was uh, assaulted by those brethren within and confronted by those without. He said, it just seems like I'm dying every day of my life. And you say, "Woo, that's drama. I think Paul was just being realistic. I think every day this man wakes up, plods down the road in order to share the gospel, and something crazy just happens to happen every day of his life. And in fact, that would make sense, because if you believe what he said, that he has a thorn in the flesh, which he would clarify by saying, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, he literally has a demon following him around to provoke craziness on every gospel path. You ever have those days where you just think nothing is going right today? Open up a hole in the earth just to find a new plumbing problem. Going to school to find out you missed an assignment. Show up to work and you're 30 minutes late for the meeting that you didn't know anything about. Come home and go, looking forward to a nice, quiet evening. And then you think, is the circus in town? What? Oh no, that's the children in my home. Clowns they are. I die daily. I'm going through a lot, people. That's the King Joe version, second opinions. 
But he says, listen, if the resurrection is real and the power can be supplied to you that was supplied to Jesus, that we can indeed live in the power of the resurrection, then Christians, we can no longer ignore those powerful and potent realities because doing so turns us back to the world to find satisfaction where we will never find satisfaction. If all we have is this world, then eat and drink and be merry. Hey, and the, and the rest of the day to yourselves. When we have difficulty dealing with suffering in whatever form it may come in, as Paul questions, why, why do we stand in jeopardy every hour? Why do we have difficulty with death? Why do we worry about potentially losing money or our career? Life is difficult, but it's more difficult when we fail to remember the potency of the resurrection. And it gets even worse when we think that the only things we have going for us are the broken things that this world has to offer. This world is never going to help us get across the finish line. The world is not the author and finisher of our faith. Only the resurrected Lord is. Don't, don't, don't make life more difficult by forgetting the resurrection. See, we want more certainty in our earthly lives, which makes total sense. But we already have it. Paul, who, who himself faced radical challenges on a daily basis, advises us to look squarely into the eyes of the resurrected Christ and affirm, you are all I need. In fact, Paul in this chapter or in any other of his writings offers nothing else. But why would he or God offer us anything less than the best that he's already given us in Jesus Christ? Paul is calling the Corinthians to see the foolishness of ignoring the incredible significance of the resurrection. In other words, there is no need for something more. We just need to drill down deeper into what we already have. We have a profound hope that gives us the ability to live righteously and share the hope of the resurrection with others. It is indeed time for Christians to wake up, to awake to righteousness. Our lives communicate the reality and the credibility of the resurrection to unbelievers. And a believer who is ensnared by sin has no witness to the lost around them. Those who, as verse 34 says, have not the knowledge of God. Paul will quote a Greek poet when he says, evil communications corrupt good manners. It's no doubt would be familiar to Paul's readers. And what he's saying is, even you know, and even they know, these godless poets, that unless you keep yourself holy and pure, by keeping yourself with God's people, and by listening to the Holy Spirit, you're just going to be corrupted. Paul would say it a little bit differently. He says the body or the believer's body is the temple of God, and it must be kept separated from the sins of this world. Second Corinthians chapter seven and verse one, Paul is affirming, having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God to fellowship with the, as Paul would say, the unfruitful works of darkness corrupts God's people. And what a shameful thing it is to use his word. What a shameful thing it is to be so tied up, selfishly living in sin while multitudes go without Christ. So each responsible person on earth will share in either the resurrection of life and go to heaven, or the resurrection of judgment, and go to hell. To quote Jesus himself, in John chapter 5, verses 28 and 29, he emphasized, marvel not at this, the hour is coming, in the which all that are in the graves shall hear his voice, and shall come forth, they that have done good, unto the resurrection of life. And they that have done evil 
unto the resurrection of damnation. The reality of the resurrection has a twofold effect, sanctification and evangelism. We know their fate. Awake. Don't live selfishly, living in your own lifestyle that keeps you away from sharing the gospel. Whether it's time, schedule, agenda, priorities, what you say is important, but how differently you live to emphasize a different matter of importance. There are people who will rise again from the dead, but will be damned. I speak this to our shame. One church in Kansas had this as its slogan. Wake up, sing up, preach up, pray up, and pay up. But never give up or let up or back up or shut up until the cause of Christ in this church and in the world is built up. I like the little sassiness there. I'll tell you a story and we'll call it quits. I heard about a man named Jim, and this particular uh, gentleman uh, helped in his church with the oversight of, uh, of evangelism, and his particular focus was uh, contacting new people that had just moved into the area. And in this particular area, he came into contact with a man named Sun Lee and his family. Now, these, uh, these folks were Vietnamese refugees uh, who had recently moved to that area. They had nothing. And I, I mean nothing. No possessions. They didn't know anybody. They needed help really in every way that you could possibly imagine. Now, Jim wanted to do something to help. So he began by trying to help with food, and, and uh, they tried to find Sun Lee a job and, and really do everything they can. But Jim, of course, he, he wanted to tell Sun Lee about Jesus Christ. But there's a significant problem, an understandable problem. He didn't speak Vietnamese, and Sun Lee did not speak English very well. So in kind of a way of uh, communicating the best that they could, they're both trying to learn the other's language. Sun Lee, of course, coming to an English-speaking country, wants to speak English. And Jim wants to show that he's, he's trying to communicate, trying to understand the culture, trying to understand the language and convey to him that, that he cares and that he wants to share something with him. So both of these men are, are learning the language and they're starting to become better friends. But there was a particular day I came along where Jim felt that he, he just didn't know enough. He didn't know enough Vietnamese. He didn't know how to communicate how to, sun, uh, to Sun Lee about Jesus Christ or anything. So he started to, get, started to get frustrated. He would try to explain God. He would try to explain Jesus. And the more they talked, honestly, it just seemed to get more and more confusing. And Sun Lee would repeat in Vietnamese a little bit, of what Jim had said in English, and they would kind of go back and forth, and finally Jim was just, he was frustrated. He was just, he was ready to give up. He decided to give up everything. He was, he just wasn't gonna learn Vietnamese anymore, and he says, you know, this is it. But much to his surprise, Sun Lee, at this point, while Jim was debating and wrestling internally, he asked a question. Is your God like you? If he is, I want to know him. And Jim says, well, actually, <laughs> he's way better than, than me, to say the least. He's, he's far greater and greater and greater than you could ever imagine. And, and, and Sun Lee wanted to know more about Jesus Christ, but only if he was like Jim. What was Jim like? Caring, hospitable, loving, burdened, compassionate. Or to just maybe put it another way, he was a man who showed love, joy, peace, gentleness, goodness, meekness, faith, and temperance. He's a man that 
showed the fruit of the Spirit because he was a man that walked in the Spirit. And Sun Lee wanted a God that could do that in someone's life. And he wanted God to do that in his life. And Jim had for months and months thought he was not communicating. Let me assure you with the lesson that Jim learned, you are communicating. Loud and clear. You may not think it. You may not always believe it. But the greatest form of communication that you and I can have is the example of a life touched by the resurrection power of Jesus Christ. Whatever your plan, agenda, purpose in life, let me affirm that it is this, to awake to righteousness and to sin not, and to share the hope of the resurrected Christ with those who need him. And we know there are those who need him. And we ought to be ashamed if we do not share the gospel. Woe unto me if I preach not the gospel. Does your life communicate the reality of the resurrection? What changes do you need to make today and this week to demonstrate the real hope of the resurrection to those around you, especially to those who need that hope the most? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the reality of the resurrection and the grace that you give to us to live to your glory. And Father, I pray that you would lead us by your spirit into your will, that we would know what changes need to be made, that we may be channels of grace demonstrating the reality of the resurrection and to communicate with greatest clarity the meaning, the transformative gospel of Jesus Christ. May you be glorified as we make decisions to do so in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, I believe um, we have just a, an echo of the announcements that are from this morning. And the only ones that I will um, repeat because they're not written down in a bulletin are the life group meetings, uh, fellowships that are coming up this Saturday. That's for the young adults. And you can see the Schoenweisses about that. And the young families uh, will be meeting this Saturday at Soundside Park at four o'clock. And the Goodwills would be here uh, for you to coordinate with them. They, they have been sick and the kids have been sick for a long time. And I'm, I'm not trying to share anyone's business, but they, it, it's been a very, it's been a very, very, very rough week, and uh, I don't think they would feel bad about me sharing that. And so please pray for them, and um, if you get a chance, encourage them. Just send them a text message. Do, the, do this with more than just the Goodwills, but send them a text. Hey, I'm praying for you. You know, I heard you were sick. heard you all were sick. I um, just want to pray for you, let you know I'm praying for you, and encourage one another and love one another. It's one thing to provoke one another. It's another thing to provoke them to love and good works. All right, on that, do we have anything else? Perfect. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. We uplift your holy name and praise you for your majesty. God, as we thank you that Jesus Christ arose and has ascended and is presently at the right hand of your majesty, we thank you that we can know him. Father, guide us into your will. We thank you that we can know Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Help us to live to your glory, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. You're dismissed. Thank <laughs> you.